Okay, and welcome back to Indo Anesthesia. I hope everyone is still uh, spreaded for this event. Uh, we still have two more sessions, interesting sessions. For the next session, we will talk about prilokine. I think for colleagues in, in Indonesia, this is a uh, quite new drug. So I invite all uh, Indonesian colleagues to give questions, comments about these drugs because we will have two prominent speakers who are uh, have more than uh, they have history of using this drug before. Uh, we will have the first speaker is Dr. Robi Erskine from the United Kingdom. And the second speaker is Professor Max Smitner from Germany. And for this session, we'll be led by Dr. Dwi Pancha Wibowo. And I would like also to thank B. Brown Medical Indonesia for sponsoring this session. Please, Dr. Pancha. Thank you, Dr. Krisha. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera, shalom, om swastiastu, namo buddhaya, salam kebajikan, sampurasun. Uh, welcome everybody to this session. This will be the interesting session because we will have uh, two speakers who will talk about the prilokine. The first is Dr. Rebi, Robi, and the second one is Professor Mark Uh, Dr. Robi is from uh, United Kingdom and uh, pro uh, Professor Mark from Germany. <clears throat> We will uh, begin with uh, Dr. Robi Eskrin. He is a consultant in anesthesiology, in anesthesis and acute pain, lead University Hospital of Derby and Burton, uh, United Kingdom. He was trained in Leicester, Derby and Nottingham and uh, has been consultant since 1994. And his uh, interest is in regional and spinal anesthesia, uh, especially in uh, the area of vascular trauma and orthopedics, with the particular interest in knee surgery and day case spinal anesthesia. And <clears throat> uh, Dr. Roby will talk about the spinal hyperbaric prelocaine 2%, the right drug, right procedure, and the right patient. So, Uh, I, I please uh, welcome Dr. Roby to talk. Hi there, my name is Dr. Erskine. I'm a, an anesthetist from Derby, United Kingdom. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about spinal hyperbaric prilocaine 2%, uh, really, the, you know, which is the right drug, the right procedure, and the right patient. So spinals for ambulatory patients, this is really what the basis of our discussion is today. I'm going to talk a little bit about the pandemic and regional anesthesia, uh, why we use short acting spinal anesthetics, um, and the state of play of spinals in the UK, where we are with them and where we're going. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the evolution of short acting spinals, particularly in relation to knee surgery, which is of particular interest, um, and a little guide on how to do it, and hopefully provide you with some practical hints, and why it's an efficient choice. A few apologies. Uh, I work in a, a regionally very permissive environment in Derby in the UK. It's very easy for me to use spinal anesthesia here. The surgeons are used to it and the anesthetists are used to it and the staff are. It's very much an experience based talk. It's not too much science. Uh, I can leave that to other people. Uh, but I think you want to know about how to use this stuff. It has a strong European bias. And really, if you want to look at this dr these drugs and the use of them, uh, Europe and the UK are places to look because this is where we've used most of them. Um, it's very much a how to use it guide for spinal prilocaine, and hopefully it'll have some practical hints and considerations for, for you for when you start using it. The only article I'm going to mention, I'm afraid, is, is a bit of self-declaration uh, um, uh, here. Uh, it's an article we wrote in uh, BJA Education in the UK um, about uh, three years ago. Um, this is freely available uh, online. It's open access, so you can you can get it, and it has most of the references in there. So starting off with the pandemic and regional anesthesia. Well, one of the good things about regional anesthesia and the pandemic is that, that it's in, in, enjoyed a, an increased interest over, over the last couple of years. I think this is a good thing, um, but maybe we have to consider uh, being a little bit careful about what we can achieve if we're not used to using regional anesthesia. But certainly I think it's got some significant benefits, um, particularly in relation to, to looking after staff, looking after patients and looking after the anesthetists themselves. 
Um, there's a certain degree of theatre efficiency in using these drugs uh, and spinals, um, particularly in relation to using PPE, etc. And I think it has advantages for our post-operative care unit staff as well, from the point of view of protecting them from patients. Um, we get better patient involvement with a lot of our surgery too. They're able to ask questions during surgery, uh, perhaps discuss it with the surgeon, um, and maybe this could avoid this could avoid too many follow-ups, which can be an advantage. So spinals, getting onto spinals themselves. Well, I think we'll all agree as anaesthetists that these are a basic competency for all of us. All anaesthetists should be able to do spinal anaesthetics. It's really the non-regional anaesthetists, um, uh, regional anaesthetic. It has a very low failure rate. Uh, they're very consistently effective spinals. Um, they're highly effective in operative analgesic and um, cause profound muscle relaxation and really suitable for most surgery below the umbilicus. There are problems though with spinals, as we know. Uh, headaches, well, we use atraumatic needles, or often 27 gauge needles, and that, that's pretty effective. Uh, itching, this is common with the use of opioids. Um, and this has uh, been a problem with using low dose pipivacaine spinals in the past, where we've tried to get away with using low doses of, of local anaesthetic for day case surgery. Um, and the opioids cause itching and patients don't like it. And then, of course, urinary retention, the great problem with spinal anaesthetics. Well, this is mainly associated with the use of pipivacaine. Even low dose pipivacaine can cause this, especially in, uh, when using opioids as well. Nerve injury, incredibly rare. So spinals are really very safe as shown in the NAT3 study in the UK 2009. Spinals can not work sometimes. Again, this isn't a great problem. You can either repeat it um, or alter your plan, but you've not really gone anywhere you, you can, can't get back from. Delayed recovery, again, delayed recovery associated, is very much associated with bupivacaine and not such a problem with the newer agents, so we'll talk about that. Then you've got the awake patient. I mean, some of you may have surgeons who don't like having patients awake. Um, this is completely understandable. Um, not such a problem where we are, but I can understand that that might be an issue. Um, I don't have a problem at all with offering patients um, sedation if appropriate. Clearly, there are some patients where it's not the right thing to do, um, and uh, that has to be discussed with the surgical team and the theatre team. But I think it's a very reasonable option. It's often reassuring for the patient too. So spinals in the UK, our experience, well, about 75% of awake surgery is done under spinal anaesthesia in the UK. It is the commonest and simplest regional anaesthetic. I think it's still underused, uh, not offered as much as it can be as an option. There was an observational study done from Guys and Thomas's during the early pandemic, uh, which looked at emergency surgery, and they had a significantly increase in the use of regional anaesthesia, 46% of which were spinal anaesthetics. So they play a very, very important part. So let's get on to day case anaesthesia now. What is a day case anaesthetic? Um, we talk about day case anaesthesia as a specialty a lot. But really, day case anaesthesia is just really, really good anaesthesia. Um, and you could argue that actually, why not use day case anaesthesia for every single patient? Um, I'm not saying that they'll necessarily go home on the day, but it's targeted uh, and effective. So if we use day case anaesthesia for all, it's targeted to the procedure, it's targeted to the patient and to the surgeon. And this is very much the principle of spinal anaesthesia too. Um, there are a few episodes of nausea and vomiting, early oral intake, rapid return to ambulation, good analgesia approach. I think most day case um, anaesthetists would, would, would have a good approach to analgesia because it, they have to get the patient home. So it lends itself very well to this. And less dizziness and sedation. And of course, you need the same from day case spinal anaesthesia. Traditionally, it's not been a, an issue. Um, it's been quite an issue for day case anaesthesia, but with these new drugs, uh, now I have 12 years experience of using 2% hyperbaric prilocaine. It's proven effective. You get a rapid return to normal function, even with large doses of local anaesthetic. Uh, they spend less time in the post-optic care unit, uh, fewer episodes of uh, nausea and vomiting and urinary retention compared to bupivacaine. Um, you can have patient involvement if you need to, particularly if you're doing arthroscopic surgery, for instance. And of course, it's cheap, as Mark Schmidtner will tell you. This is a little um, or less considered um, feature of day case uh, spinal anaesthesia. 
is of course patients can leave their dentures in and their spectacles on. This may seem a small thing, but actually patient dignity is a very, very important part of what we do. I think it's important that patients feel, um, feel they're able to be comfortable and, and feel more human. So, day case spinal anesthesia, is it short acting spinal anesthesia we're looking at here? Or as I prefer to call it, targeted spinal anesthesia. So targeted to the procedure, the patient and the surgeon. So you're very much taking each patient on their merits, each procedure and each surgeon and targeting your spinal to suit that particular procedure. What about good analgesia? Well, depends whether you believe spinals are there for analgesia or not, and we'll talk about this. I believe that day case spinal anesthesia promotes good analgesia uh, because it's very important that once the spinal's worn off, you think very hard about your your multimodal and regional anesthesia approach to the patient. So I think promotes a very good approach towards some um, um, analgesia generally, and this is true of day case anesthesia, whether you're giving a general anesthetic or a spinal anesthetic. So good analgesia uh, to follow on is very important. So what about some myths about spinal anesthesia? Well, uh, a lot of people say, well, long acting spinals are great because they give you good analgesia. Well, that's true. They give you good analgesia, but they leave the patient with very heavy insensate legs. And you get the comment from some colleagues who say, well, they were comfortable when I left the patient at five o'clock in the afternoon in the recovery area. But of course, this, this is fine. But they get rebound pain on return to the ward probably a few hours later. And this is precisely the point at which you don't want the patient to have rebound pain. The time for the spinal to wear off should really be in the recovery area um, so the patient can have normal function. You can then um, institute good uh, post-operative pain relief prior to return to the ward uh, to establish a, a good initial approach to analgesia. So it's actually important that the, the, the spinal does wear off and it shouldn't really be there for, uh, for hours after the surgery. So people say, so what if they're numb for four hours? Well, if you actually talk to patients postoperatively and review how they feel, um, they don't like the heavy insensate limb. This goes for upper limb surgery and lower limb surgery as well. Um, and they, um, the patients who've had um, both bupivacaine spinals and then later on pralocaine spinals often express uh, significant uh, uh, pleasure in the benefits of avoiding a long acting heavy insensate limb. So in summary, if a four hour general anesthetic is too long for a 60 minute procedure, then a four hour spinal anesthetic is also too long for a 60 minute procedure. There is no benefit in it lasting any longer than the, the procedure time. And this is an important principle. So moving on, how do we actually do it? Well, um, for many years, I've used low dose bupivacaine uh, with an opioid. We use, use fentanyl. I know other people use sufentanil and other opioids um, to try and get away with, with the side effects of bupivacaine and improve the analgesia uh, and still allow the patient to mobilize and return home. Then you've got hyperbaric 2% pralocaine, which has been around for a few years, and we'll talk about that in a minute extensively. We have, of course, in Europe got to, and, and the States got isobaric 1% chloroprocaine. Um, you haven't got this available, but it's certainly something to look at in the future. So, bupivacaine, fantastic drug, uh, highly effective, but it's too much for most procedures. Um, they have heavy legs, retention is a significant risk, and if you're adding opioids um, uh, to low-dose bupivacaine, um, even, even, in, even in low-dose bupivacaine, pruritus and retention is still an issue and results in delayed discharge. Uh, so certainly if we are doing um, uh, using bupivacaine, even low dose after four o'clock in the afternoon, the chance of us admitting the patient overnight is 35%. So it's a significant issue. So I really avoid um, bupivacaine, if at all possible, for procedures under 110, 120 minutes. Then we've got pralocaine, or um, I think chlorotecal or whatever, um, tacopril, as we call it, um, um, depending on your marketing, um, and 2-chloroprocaine. And these have been absolute game changers in Europe. Today, we're going to concentrate on hyperbaric prilocaine, 2%. It's widely used in Europe uh, for the last uh, 10, 12 years, not in the US or Australasia, sadly. Um, it is of intermediate spinal duration, not super short, but much shorter than bupivacaine. It's licensed for 90 minutes of surgical time. That's the time that you make the incision till the time the dressing goes on. 
clearly that means that the drug actually lasts a little bit longer than that. And um, uh, if you're doing knee, foot, ankle surgery, it's certainly lower dermatomal surgery, you can uh, actually achieve up to 120 minutes of analgesia uh, for these patients. Um, less so for hip surgery, and I'll go on to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the hyperbaric property, and this is a really, really important point, the hyperbaric nature of pralocaine, um, uh, hyperbaric 2%, um, means that you can allow for manipulation of the height of the block by varying your dose and the position of the patient, and this is really helpful. Um, there's evidence of increased cardiovascular stability compared with bupivacaine in equivalent dermatomal levels. And the majority of surgical procedures um, under 100 minutes um, can be achieved using pralocaine. And it allows uh, for the use of um, day case surgery without the need for interthecal opioids. And this is really important. I don't use opioids when I'm using pralocaine anymore. There is no need. So, as I said, that's important. So, how do we target our spinals to the procedure? Well, I take a very pragmatic approach to decision making and ask myself three questions. Very simply, do I just want a saddle block, so-called perineal block, um, a very low block of, of the sacral roots? Do I particularly want a high block? So we're talking, you know, up to say T4, T, T6 level. Or is it a short or intermediate procedure? That's the next question. No opioids are required, and it's very much a per-operative analgesic spinal we're trying to achieve. We don't want it going on too much longer than the procedure. And it's very important to think about your regional block to follow for follow on pain and multimodal analgesia, either preemptively or uh, preemptively uh, post op. So we produced an aid memoir, and this is available in, in, in the article we wrote uh, for the operating theatre. This actually includes prilocaine as well, but any procedures, and I'll just click on here. So this is what we're talking about. Do you just want a saddle block? If so, using low dose uh, prilocaine, uh, and this is what you can achieve. If not, do you want a greater than T10 block for these procedures? And we'll talk about that in a minute using a much bigger dose of pralocaine. Now in, in the UK, we can choose less than an hour or an hour. If it's less than an hour, um, we use chloroprocaine. But any of these procedures for chloroprocaine, you can do quite safely and quite well with uh, pralocaine. And it allows a little bit more leeway of time for the offset. So initially, just do we just want a saddle block? Well, the great thing about pralocaine uh, is it's hyperbaric and you can take advantage of that by using a very small dose. You can get away with uh, with half a mil uh, as you get more confident, but certainly a mil is more than adequate to achieve a very good perineal block for a good um, hour and a half. Um, you can um, do all these procedures here very easily when, uh, with this sort of dose. Um, you can often, if you're using half a mil, allow the patient to actually mobilise off the table having had a hemorrhoid procedure um, and it um, it goes down very well with the patients and the staff. Now, if you want to achieve much um, higher dermatal surgery, like um, uh, greater than T10 block, like you're doing epigastric or umbilical hernias, this can be a big advantage in, in the larger patient who has perhaps um, uh, gastric reflux uh, um, and, or, or um, uh, is particularly obese, uh, where you'd have to use an endotracheal tube and general anesthesia for, for a very short procedure. So we use a lot of these for these patients, highly effective in day case, and they can still go home. Interestingly, diagnostic laparoscopies, we do quite a few of these, particularly staff, actually, they're very keen to avoid general anesthesia, and we can use um, generous doses of prilocaine to achieve this, and they can still go home. And then in urology, day case urology, we're doing it a lot for ureteroscopies and high stent procedures and lasers. And it's very important to use a bigger dose here because um, the dermatomal levels of the, the kidney supply are a little bit higher. And when they're pushing uh, wires into the kidney, that can be an issue. So very, very suitable for that. And again, they can be discharged home quite easily on the same day, no side effects. Then we get onto the part of the chart which deals with how long the procedure is, if it's not particularly high or particularly low. And chloroprocaine we use for these, but anything we use um, chloroprocaine for, uh, we can use prilocaine for. So we can include all of this in our dose of prilocaine here, two to three mils. And to be absolutely honest, most of the time I'm using about three mils of prilocaine. And when you start to use it, you can be quite generous and use three mils or three mils plus uh, to, to get you into a really safe, comfortable, comfortable zone. And you'll still be able to discharge the patient home. So practically, how does this translate to a typical theatre session? So I will take a, a typical um, or orthopedic list. Um, so this is the traditional uh, approach using even low dose bupivacaine with an opioid. 
and you can see you're doing arthroscopies, um, an ACL, uh, total knee replacement. This green line represents the surgical time. The blue line represents the time for the block to regress. So even when you're using low dose bupivacaine, there's still a quite prolonged block regression time for the patient. And you can see there's quite a mismatch between your arthroscopy time, your ACL time, and even your total knee and the total length of the block. And this is not a great benefit. So how do we do it with prilocaine? Well, if you choose prilocaine for all these procedures, and you can see here that I'm now using prilocaine for my knee replacements uh, even, um, this is what you achieve. You actually remove a significant amount of your prolonged block regression time. Um, even for a, a total knee arthroplasty, I'm using this routinely now for my knees, which often take uh, sort of 70, 80, 90 minutes. So you've got quite a lot of leeway here, even for the slower surgeon. Uh, clearly, if you've got a very slow surgeon, you're doing complicated revision knees, it's not the drug to use. But for most straightforward knee surgery, it's very good. Certainly, cruciate ligament surgery, again, prilocaine is highly beneficial for day case surgery. Um, and for any arthroscopy, I think it, it's the really ideal agent from that point of view. So you can see the difference from the point of view of, of the drug wearing off. And this is why you can discharge your patient earlier. And the patient will, will be much happier with you and happier with the whole procedure. So if you're a first time user, you've not used this much before, you want to get confidence, uh, follow the guidelines on the decision making chart, which I produced. And remember, anything you can do with, on our chart with chloroprocaine, you can achieve with prilocaine. Try it for the shorter procedures to get confidence, like arthroscopies, urology procedures, um, simple um, general surgery procedures, gynae procedures, and get your confidence up. You can be generous with this drug. These are not low dose. The mistake people make is to try and use low doses for most procedures, except perineal. Obviously, as I said earlier on, is is it's beneficial to use a low dose. But for most procedures, they're short acting drugs, so you can use generous doses without any problem at all. You don't need to use opioids. They just cause problems. It's not licensed. There's potential for infection and mistakes, and it's not necessary. So I'd avoid them. Um, know your surgery, know your surgeon. This is true of all regional anesthesia and spinal anesthesia, but I think particularly important uh, when you're starting to use these shorter agents. And then expand your use as you become more confident. So start with the shorter procedures and then move on as you get more confident and you will become more confident. And you'll also find it very hard to go back to using bupivacaine um, when you've used these drugs. So what about our experience in Derby? We've got very extensive experience now. Most people, most of my colleagues in Derby are used to using these drugs now. Uh, and uh, hyperbaric prilocaine is very popular. Um, we've done well over 2000 and probably more knee arthroscopies now over the first seven years up to 2018, and we're still using it. Um, procedures, anything from 20 to 115 minutes, spinal to dressing time. Most procedures are probably less than 40, 50 minutes anyway. We've had no particular aversions to general anesthesia in this sort of dose, um, no delayed discharges. We have had four episodes where patients developed urinary retention in elderly males. Three needed an in-app catheter and one was able to pass urine a bit later, but they all went home. And there were no overnight admissions due to the spinal anaesthetic. So it's been a real benefit from their point of view and it's made spinal anaesthesia very popular in our day case unit. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically now about the evolution of uh, the use of these new agents and how they fit in with our approach to um, enhance recovery for knee surgery. And we're talking total knee replacement and unicompart metal knee replacement. So here we are. This is how it's gone over the years. Back in the 80s and 90s when I started anaesthesia, uh, we used to use general anaesthesia or heavy spinal anaesthesia with bupivacaine. They'd have a PCA morphine pump, total body analgesia afterwards, a uh, lot of nausea and vomiting, quite prolonged stay. Um, and urinary retention was significant. They often had a catheter routinely. In the 90s, we'd do a combined spinal epidural, so uh, top half would recover quite nicely, wouldn't be a problem, uh, but they'd have a very prolonged epidural block for two, three, four days. Uh, excellent analgesia, obviously clearly they'd require a, a urinary catheter and intravenous infusion, and the physiotherapy tended to be rather um, limited from the point of view of, of active mobilization. In the 2000s, we moved on. We start, we're still using bupivacaine spinals, nothing else was available. Um, so again, urine retention was a risk, but we're now starting to use more targeted with ultrasound guided uh, regional anesthesia, femoral nerve blocks and uh, sciatic nerve blocks. Again, very good analgesia, 
but not ideal for mobilization, and they still have problems of going home uh, soon after surgery. They still have a length of stay of four or five days. In the 2010s, we started to move on to um, enhanced recovery approach to, 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 to knee, knee uh, arthroplasties and hip arthroplasties. And um, what we do, we're using a low dose spinal anesthetics, again, still using bifurcaine, perhaps with an opioid, uh, to try and get away with, with mobilizing the patient soon after surgery. It was a variable use and often required a little bit of sedation or extra analgesia, so not ideal, but certainly, benefit, certainly a big benefit over previously. And we're using a local infiltration analgesia as well. So again, the patient could mobilize far better post-op and the length of stay went down to about three days. Now, this is the approach very much in relation to using something like Prilocaine. In the 2020s, I'm now using um, targeted spinal anesthesia using Prilocaine. Um, uh, so we don't have to use low doses. We can use um, a generous dose of Prilocaine. They're now getting a femoral triangle block um, and an IPAC block. And um, uh, we, we find that the patients are able to reduce them to the stay and go home the, often the next day. This gentleman had a surgery in the morning. Uh, he's 82 years old and um, he, uh, you can see he's still got his candor in his arm. Um, and uh, he's able to mobilize in the afternoon quite comfortably without any problems at all. He's able to sit himself in the chair, even when he misses the chair, he's still able to be quite comfortable. There we are. So um, looking at knee arthroplasty in general, um, the, the bigger surgery, um, 2015 to 2021, uh, we've now done over 150 Prilocaine spinals for um, knee arthroplasty. This is just myself, although we've used, many other people have used it. Uh, we looked at um, surgical and tourniquet times, uh, if you're interested. Um, so this is the median surgical times. That's the time of the spinal actually being put in to the dressing time going on, okay. So anything from 67 to 89 minutes uh, with a tourniquet time of uh, uh, median of 59 minutes. So even slightly longer surgery for knee, knee surgery is not a problem at all. We found for unicompartmental knees and patellofemoral knee replacements is even shorter. So these are all amenable to, to uh, spinal analysis using, using Prilocaine. And it's now my, my, my agent of choice for a total knee arthroplasty. So if we if we want to produce a little target target um, uh, group to look at uh, and a diagram, um, this shows knee surgery using procedure targeted spinal anesthesia uh, using two percent hyperbaric prilocaine. I've included isobaric chloroprocaine, but as I said earlier on, anything you can do with chloroprocaine, you can easily do with prilocaine. This is just a slight refinement for for the UK and and uh, and Europe. So if it's less than 80 minutes and you're doing knee surgery. Um, I would choose Prilocaine uh, for, for all these procedures. Anything from uh, all of these procedures here, uh, right through to even some uh, trauma procedures, uh, through to total knee arthroplasty, difficult ACLs, tibial osteotomies, uh, et cetera. So again, three, three and a half mils, you can be, as I said, very generous with Prilocaine um, and it can give you up to 100, 120 minutes of really good anesthesia. So highly effective, be generous, and uh, you'll find, uh, find it very useful. Anything really over 100, 110, 120 minutes, you'll see how you get on with it. I'd still use bupivacaine, which is a very effective drug, but remember that it's not going to give you a rapid mobilization. So, prilocaine up to 100, 120 minutes, no problem at all. Neoarthroplasty, as I said, prilocaine, uh, difficult knees, bupivacaine. So, the trend is very much towards prilocaine for a total knee, unless it's particularly tricky. What about hip surgery? Um, well, if you're looking at, again, a procedure targeted spinal disease for hip surgery, I would, you can see the times are slightly shorter for hip surgery because clearly the dermatomal level is higher and the drug will regress from the top down. So you can see if it's less than 60 minutes, um, quite a lot of these simple short procedures, I'll use um, chloroprocaine, but again, we're lucky enough to have that in the UK. Don't worry, anything you do here, I would use Prilocaine for, um, and you're, it gives you a lot more confidence. So we use a lot of um, chloroprocaine or, or, or prilocaine for hip screws in fractured um, uh, hips. Uh, MUA's hips that are dislocated, joint injections, very effective. Um, anything longer, prilocaine is a drug of choice. And I tend to use up to three and a half mils quite often to get a really good high block for a longer period of time. Fine for hemiarthroplasty or a total hip replacement. Slightly lower dose for hemiarthroplasty because they're elderly and they require less, uh, less uh, prolonged surgery. 
uh, and less sympathetic block. Anything greater than 90 minutes hip surgery, if you've got a slower surgeon or um, a longer procedure, any of these procedures, I would choose bupivacaine. So you can see how they complement each other. Recent advantages, as I said, to sum it up, um, hemiarthroplasties, broken hips, prior cane, two and a half mils, is reliable, effective, quick onset, and I think it gives you more cardiovascular stability. And probably something which is perhaps underregarded, but just as important, is these patients have a less prolonged sympathetic block in recovery. And this is really important. When we've got a patient in theatre, we can control their blood pressure very easily. The time they're more in danger in many ways is when they return to recovery with a prolonged spinal block. The great thing about using prilocaine is they don't have this. So you can avoid this prolonged effect and have a more cardiovascularly stable patient. So a big advantage in elderly patients. This is a typical trauma list I did the other week. Um, so uh, typical selection of patients on a, on a trauma list, uh, lower limb surgery, uh, right through from Bremen, uh, short nailing, uh, left cannulated hip screws, uh, tibial fractures, washout of a knee laceration and a fixation of an ankle. Prior came used for all of these surgeries, with no problem at all. This is the time of the surgery itself from the spinal going into the dressing time. Um, Obviously, it's a very complex uh, uh, ankle fracture. You might choose bupivacaine, but for most straightforward fractures, prilocaine is sufficient. We've also added our regional blocks in as well to take over the pain relief afterwards. And this is an integral part of using any anaesthetic, actually, but particularly focused when using short acting agents. Prilocaine in urology, I think probably a lot of you will be starting to use this for urology. Uh, we do all these procedures using prilocaine or shorter. As I said, I've included chloroprocaine here on my chart, but actually anything done uh, on here in urology can be done using that sort of dose of prilocaine. And just remember, ureteroscopies and stents need a slightly bigger dose of prilocaine to get a higher block, but again, very effective. If you're using circum doing a circumcision or preanal abscess, anything like this, um, you can use a very low dose of prilocaine. Just remember that um, scrotal surgery is okay, but when you're doing testicular surgery, you have to think that the nerve supply of the, of the testicle itself is much higher up, and so you have to use a larger dose of prilocaine. Just be aware of that. So this is where we are. Uteroscopy and stent, generous prilocaine, perineal field procedures, very low dose prilocaine. So here you're taking advantage very much of the hyperbaric nature to uh, achieve benefit. So urology day case, 50% um, of our bladder tumours go home. Only those bleeding with irrigation need to stay in. And it used to be that if they'd had a spinal, they were often kept in because they had a catheter. But now it's no longer spinal equals catheter equals admit. It's now very much a surgical decision. So if they choose to get the patient in for surgical reasons, that's why they stay in. But it's not an anesthetic reason anymore. And this is a big advantage. Um, the blood neck incisions, urethrotomies, um, they'll have a catheter and they'll go home with a catheter in. And the TURPs often stay in because of you know, potential for bleeding. Uh, Uroteric stents, many, many, many of them go home, provided they're, they're, they're quite well otherwise. Uh, gynecology, again, um, in Derby, a lot of gynecology procedures are done this way. Elderly for vulval biopsies, uh, we tend to use low-dose prilocaine uh, here. Fenton procedures, so, you know, and perineal repairs in um, postpartum uh, patients, uh, we use uh, low-dose prilocaine. Minimal leg weakness, very effective, and the patients like it. Particularly good for breastfeeding mums who come in, so maybe have a, had a baby at home, and uh, they they choose to um, choose to bring their baby in with them, and they can get home afterwards, having had the repair of their perineum done. Laparoscopy, uh, not commonly done, but staff commonly requested, um, mostly diagnostic or sterilizations, um, may be included as part of your laparoscopic hysterectomy procedure, right, including a GA as well. Um, very effective. Uh, we do a lot of vaginal repairs, uh, sacrospinous fixations, vag cysts, colpoclysis, uh, allows rapid return of function. We often include an opioid for the pelvic work, or something like diamorphine and morphine, gives some good post-operative and visceral pain relief. Um, and we use two to three mils of prilocaine. But again, you can be quite generous with prilocaine. It's not a problem. It gives you up to 90 to 110 minutes of analgesia. So um, that probably sums it up. You can do all these things using prilocaine. Vascular surgery, we're using it a lot for straightforward diabetic foot surgery. It's absolutely ideal. 
amputations, femoral endarterectomies, and perhaps difficult endovascular procedures occurring in x-ray where the patient might be in pain, and it can be very helpful. Again, if you're doing longer procedures, bupivacaine is your drug of choice, but pralocaine is very effective for many procedures. General surgery, again, can be very good. So why is it the efficient choice then, pralocaine? Well, there's no aerosol generating procedure. It's, uh, it brings increased safety, uh, time saving, and it is low cost. I think it's okay to offer sedation. It, some surgeons prefer it. Um, our surgeons tend to do what they're told, but um, I know that varies around the world. Um, and uh, I think it's generally appropriate to, to, to allow it. Clearly, there are some patients where it's not appropriate, and um, that's why the spinal anesthesia on its own might be adequate. And of course, they can change their mind. And it's very much about matching your procedure to, um, spinal to the procedure. They can keep their dentures in. I know I mentioned this before, but it's actually a very important point for a lot of patients and often they'll keep their glasses on and are able to view the screen for an arthroscopy, for instance. I tend to give them free clear fluids up till when they come to theatre. I'll sometimes even give them um, a sip of cold water in theatre, makes them feel a little bit better. Um, and um, uh, this is quite okay once the spinal is established. Uh, the patient may observe the procedure um, and maybe um, avoid some follow-up visits, which can be good environmentally and, and good sustainably. Um, there's no wake up time or area removal time in theatre, so they can be taken straight to recovery. And there's time of recovery and safety of the post uh, anaesthetic care, care unit staff and recovery staff is significantly shorter. And they can get up and, and, and leave hospital fairly rapidly. Now, we often talk about range anxiety. So I have an electric car. Many people have started to buy them now. And the first question you always ask, and this is very pertinent to uh, pralocaine uh, spinal anesthesia is what is the range and the best answer to range anxiety in an electric car is to actually buy an electric car and use it and you find after one or two trips that actually you become very confident and it's not a problem and really it's the same for targeted spinals if you're worried about how long they're going to last start with shorter simpler procedures use a generous dose gain confidence and then move on to bigger procedures with time. You will find it harder and harder to use bupivacaine once you've started using pralocaine. So in summary, um, short acting spinal anesthetics um, or spinal anesthesia in general is the non-regionalist regional anesthetic of choice. Um, using spinal hyperbaric 2% pralocaine means a simple, safe, effective and very efficient spinal anesthetic. And I think the more you use it and the more you try and use it, um, the more you will enjoy using it and you'll move on. So thank you very much for listening uh, and good luck with your usage of uh, hyperbaric spinal pralocaine. Thank you, Dr. Robbie. And uh, it was uh, very interesting. And we will have a discussion after the second speaker for this session. Uh, but Dr. Robbie, you may uh, answer some question in the Q&A uh, on this uh, Q&A uh, column here, so you can uh, answer before we have a live discussion after the uh, Professor Mark uh, speak, speaking. Okay, for the, for the next, we will have, uh, we have uh, Professor Mark Smithner from Germany and uh, Yes, uh, welcome. <laughs> and uh, he will also speak uh, regarding the prelocaine for the DK surgery uh, from Germany experience, German experience. Okay, time is yours, Professor. Come on. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to everybody. And hello from Germany. It's a really stormy morning here. It's yeah. uh, uh, it's 9 p.m. and we have a really strong storm over Europe. I'm in the clinic and uh, take care for the for also for the patients. And it's a real pleasure for me to to be here in this uh, in this event because I really believe in um, uh, the substance Prilocaine. I have a, a strong um, connection to to this substance because I use it for more than 12 years now. Um, in my in my former clinic um, near Heidelberg University Clinic of Heidelberg, we had about two thousand patients with colorectal diseases per oh. year. So, 
physis, condyloma, um, all, all things you don't want to have, but about 10% of the patients uh, mm -hmm. of the population suffers from. Mm -hmm. It's called Ford disease. And uh, yeah, I did a lot of research and used um, a pre 2% hyperbaric because in my opinion, this is one of the most ideal substance uh, for this for this purpose, and um, yeah, there, there's a reason uh, why I pre-recorded um, the the presentation because in the pandemic I had some very disappointing experiences with online meetings when the technique doesn't work. So <laughs> just to be sure, I pre-recorded the uh, the. Uh, my my presentation and afterwards I'm looking forward to the discussion because okay. it's yeah it, it, it's it's easier to interact and uh, just yeah. to share my to, to to share my experience. Okay. So I would suggest to to start the presentation, please. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Welcome to the presentation: Prelocaine, the new drug for short-acting spinal anesthesia in day case surgery experiences from Germany. My name is Mark Schmidtner and I'm from the Unfallkrankenhaus Berlin. When we are taking a look on OECD data, we can see that there's a worldwide trend towards ambulatory surgery. On the one hand side, we can see a lot of countries with a high percentage of ambulatory anesthesia and surgery, but there are also countries where a lot of improvement needs to be done. But what we can also see that during the last 10 years, a lot of countries improved, like Austria, for, for example, and uh, doubled their uh, numbers of ambulatory procedures. At this point, we have no clear information about the anesthesia technique chosen for ambulatory surgery. On this slide, we can see a survey amongst 108 anesthesiologists performing nearly 87,000 operative procedures from the year 2011. The result was that about 80% received general anesthesia, only 12% received local anesthesia, 6% regional anesthesia, and at the end there were 2% receiving spinal anesthesia. The question is if the anesthesiologist has a significant influence on the processes of ambulatory surgery. And I say definitely yes. So far, general anesthesia is dominant and regional anesthesia is still the exception, but there have been a lot of innovations within the last years. And there are new formulations of local anesthetics which make fast track spinal possible. Maybe there's also the factor of cost reduction using these products. So far, only a few data are available. About 10 years ago, Several authors published reports about new formulations of old local anesthetics leading to a revival of these substances in ambulatory surgery. Due to the absence of stabilizers and the hyperbaricity of prilocaine, the substances led to reliable blocks, a short duration of action and appeared with nearly no side effects. A new era began. From this point, short-acting spinal became part of our daily routine because fast track spinal, this is how we call it, gives us new options for ambulatory surgery as the substances are safe and reliable. Unfortunately, general anesthesia is still dominating and spinal is still the exception in the daily use. I can't tell you all the yes and no's, but I can give you some hopefully useful recommendations after more than 10 years experience using these substances. The substance we are talking about today is Prilocaine 2% Hyperbaric. Prilocaine was launched in the year 1960. It's an amide type local anesthetic with a fast onset between 8 or 10 minutes and it has also a fast recovery between 1.5 and, and 2 hours. It shows a low incidence of TNS and as it has no preservatives there is a low risk of allergies. The brand Takipril Prilocaine 2% Hyperbaric is produced by Synthetica and was launched in the year 2010 in Germany. Now we are looking for the type of surgery Prilocaine 2% Hyperbaric is suitable for. 
Well, the indication is surgery of TH10 and below. It's suitable for short surgical interventions of up to 90 minutes. It leads to an early spontaneous micturition and there's the ability to discharge the patient very, very quickly. You can use it for any kind of general surgery or proctology, orthopedics, urology, gynecology or vascular surgery. Now let's take a closer look on the dosage of Tachypril. One ampoule contains 5 ml Prilocaine 2% hyperbaric, meaning that 1 ml contains 20 mg of Prilocaine. Due to its hyperbaric properties, Tachypril can be used both for unilateral and bilateral spinal anesthesia. The duration of action is depending on the dosage, which means that a higher dose goes hand in hand with a longer duration of action. The recommended maximum dose of Tachypril is 4 ml, which is 80 mg Prilocaine and corresponds to the dose of other intrathecally administered local anesthetics. For the daily routine, I would recommend to use Tachypril in a dosage between 2 and 3 ml. The more you apply, the higher the block rises. This leads also to a longer duration of action. A special case is the saddle block, meaning a very deep spinal anesthesia with hyperbaric local anesthetics. A saddle block is perfectly tailored for proctologic surgery like hemorrhoids, fissures, abscesses and condyloma. The big advantage of a saddle block is, after application of half a milliliter or one milliliter of tachypril, the area of surgery is perfectly numb and relaxed whereas the patient can still move his or her legs. As the spinal block is on a very low level, the sympathicus is not activated and involved, resulting in nearly no hypotension and bradycardia. Now let's take a closer look on some studies comparing prilocaine with other substances. For example, in this slide, prilocaine versus bupivacaine in a randomized controlled trial called Spinal Anesthesia with Hyperbaric Prilocaine in Day Case Perianal Surgery, a randomized controlled trial. And the authors randomized 50 patients and uh, 25 of them received 7.5 mg Bupivaca in 0.5 Hyperbaric and 20 mg of fentanyl. And the other 25 patients re received 30 mg of Prilocaine uh, 0.5% hyperbaric plus also 20 microgram of fentanyl. And uh, what the authors found was that uh, in the prelogating group, um, the PECU time was about 30 minutes uh, shorter, the time to stand unassisted about 40 minutes, the same as the time to walk unassisted and the time for home readiness. So in all these categories, prelocaine was superior to bupivacaine. On this slide, I want to show you data comparing prelocaine and mepivacaine from our own study group. Uh, it was published in the year 2014 and is called Spinal Hyperbaric Prelocaine versus Mepivacaine in Perianal Outpatient Surgery. What we did is we randomized in a prospective controlled trial 180 patients receiving either 10 mg of uh, prilocaine 2% hyperbaric or 20 mg of mepivaca in 4% hyperbaric, resulting both in a volume of half a milliliter. The results were that in the prilocaine group, the recovery room time was significantly shorter and the time to the first micturition and to discharge were about 30 minutes earlier. Very interesting was that uh, we asked for TNS after one week and we saw that there was no patient in the prilocaine group versus six patients in the mepivacaine group. The next study published by Jose Aguirre in the year 2015, prilocaine and ropivacaine are compared. The study group performed a randomized prospective trial with 140 patients. Half of them received a spinal anesthesia with 60 milligrams of prilocaine 2% hyperbaric, resulting in 3 milliliters. 
The other 70 patients received a spinal anesthesia with 12 mg of in 0.5% isobaric, resulting also in 3 milliliters. And the results were that in the prelocating group, the recovery from motor block was about 60 minutes earlier than with ropivacaine. Our results were supported by a review article performed by Jan Bublik and colleagues titled Prelocaine Spinal Anesthesia for Ambulatory Surgery, a review of the available studies. And he performed a Medline and M-based database research for the time period of 1966 until 2015 with 14 prospective and one retrospective article. And the results were that uh, all the authors used doses between 40 and 80 milligrams and hyperbaric prelocaine in doses as low as 10 milligrams can be used for perianal procedures. This was our study. The duration of block was 129 plus minus 41 minutes. The time of voiding 241 plus minus uh, 28 minutes and only four cases of TNS were reported. So the authors conclude that uh, um, prelocaine is, a safe and and is safe and reliable for day case anesthesia. Now let's talk about the development of methemoglobin after the application of prelocaine. Our own research group published an article in the year 2010 where 30 patients received up to 4,000 milligrams of prelocaine in the context of tumors and local anesthesia. As a result, methemoglobin levels rise up to 14% 12 hours after application of prelocaine. In the case of Tagipril, you apply very, very low doses as a maximum of 100 mg of prelocaine. So due to the low dosages, there is really no relevant risk, risk to develop a methemoglobin in healthy adults. Having a new short-acting substance available for spinal anesthesia does not mean that you can now start immediately to use this substance and everybody likes what you do. Introducing Tachypril into your clinical portfolio means that you have to introduce spinal anesthesia in your department, a safe technique being used for more than 100 years now that is still fraught with prejudices. Since I've been dealing with this topic for more than 10 years now, I would like to give you a few ideas in the next few minutes to establish prelocaine 2% hyperbaric in your everyday clinical routine. To implement these short-acting local anesthetics in your daily routine, you must rethink your processes. At the beginning, you must identify surgical procedures which are suitable for spinal anesthesia, for example, uro, proctor, gynecological procedures or knee atroscopies or orthopedic surgery. Always keep in mind that the surgery time should not extend about 90 minutes for pre in After you have decided what type of surgery you plan to do in the ambulatory setting, you should start to plan your week. In case you choose to perform five knee atroscopies per week, it is not really efficient to plan one knee atroscopy per day. It is much more efficient to plan operations of the same kind, one after the other, at one day. If you want to be even more efficient, you should operate on the same side as many patients as possible before you change the side. For example, if you perform knee atroscopies one after the other, but on different sides, you must move the atroscopy tower after each operation and you lose a lot of time so you should better operate on the same side as long as possible. My next secret for a successful ambulatory spinal is give intravenous premedication. Our group published an article about the influence of anxiolytic premedication on vasovagal reactions and home readiness following outpatient intrathecal anesthesia. Therefore, we performed a retrospective analysis of 2,747 patients with ambulatory spinal anesthesia. 1,291 received 1 to 2 milligram midazolam intravenously, 
and uh, altogether 314 patients suffered from a vasovagal syncope. The incidence was that uh, without premedication, 217 patients and with premedication, only 97 patients suffered from these vasovagal syncopes. So, midazolam was able to reduce the incidence for about 50%. And what we also found out is that the premedication did not prolong the time to achieve readiness for discharge. Even as the exact mechanism remains still unclear, the use of atraumatic thin spinal needles results in a significant reduction of posterior puncture headache. This picture shows scanning electron microscope images of the dura after puncture with the traumatic on the left side and an atraumatic spinal cannula. The dural damage after puncture with a traumatic spinal needle resembles that of a sickle. You can well imagine that CSF can escape more easily here. On the right side, you can see the crater-shaped lesion of the dura. Only a small amount of CSF leakage is to be expected here. Therefore, use atraumatic spinal needles of size 25 gauche and smaller. The pathophysiology of another anesthesia cause side effect is also not fully understood. Transient neurologic symptoms, TNS. So far, it is only certain that the local anesthetic used is significantly involved in the development of TNS. Substances such as mepivacaine and lidocaine are associated with incidences up to 20%. When using prilocaine, bupivacaine, ropivacaine and chloroprocaine, the probability of TNS is about 1-2%. to 2 Therefore, only the short-acting substances prelocaine and chloroprocaine should be used for outpatient interventions. When prelocaine 2% hyperbaric was launched in Germany in the year 2010, our research group was really interested in this substance as we treated a very large number of patients with proctoloctic diseases in our hospital. In earlier publications, we demonstrated that spinal anesthesia with long-lasting hyperbaric pupivacaine was superior to general anesthesia in terms of analgesic consumption within 24 hours after surgery and aspects of post-operative recovery for in-house patients. So hyperbaric prelocaine would be ideal for ambulatory patients because of its short duration of action and the low incidence of TNS. Therefore, we initiated a dose-finding study with 120 patients who received 10, 20 or 30 mg prelocaine 2% hyperbaric. As a result, we found that due to the sufficient analgesia, the missing motor block, the short recovery times, 10 mg prelocaine 2% hyperbaric, which is half a milliliter, would be the recommended dosage. In the following pictures, you can see what it can look like when several patients are operated on with proctological interventions one after the other in the outpatient operating center. The first patient on the left-hand side has already received half a milliliter of prelocaine 2% hyperbaric and is waiting for the start of operation. The spinal anesthesia is being punctured in the second patients. The other patients are being prepared for the spinal anesthesia. Now here you can see our patient number one who received the spinal anesthesia about 10 to 20 minutes ago. The saddle block sits perfectly and she can now be brought into the operating room where the previous patient is being driven out at this moment. The really special thing about prelocaine 2% hyperbaric in a low dosage is that firstly it causes almost no drop in blood pressure and secondly it has little or no effect on leg motoric skills. Here you can see how our patient can slide onto the operating table without outside help. In this last picture, you can see our patient undergoing her proctological procedure. She is totally painless and completely relaxed, as is the whole surgical team. Meanwhile, our second patient is being prepared for transport to the operating room and patients 3 and 4 have already received their spinal anesthesia. The next secret to successful ambulatory spinal anesthesia is 
give only a small amount of intravenous fluids. It is sufficient to give less than 500 milliliters perioperatively, since no relevant blood loss is to be expected during the procedure and a drop in blood pressure is not to be expected due to the local anesthetic used. In general, all the patients are allowed to eat and drink after the operation. But what do we do if the patients meet the general discharge criteria but have not yet voided? Several international anesthesia societies have published recommendations on this subject, for example in Great Britain and Germany. In summary, it can be said that voiding is not mandatory required, although it is important to identify patients who are at particular risk of developing later problems. It is also encouraged to use ultrasound to detect an overflow bladder. The last point that I would like to address to you about successful outpatient spinal anesthesia is never implement that technology alone, but involve all the players in the hospital from the start. A few years ago, we did a patient survey in our clinic, which we unfortunately never published. We asked the patients which people actually have the greatest influence on them with regard to the choice of anesthetic methods. Interestingly, there were the surgeon, friends and family, fellow patients and nurses. The anesthesiologist was more in the backseat. Therefore, ideally, the surgeon should tell the patient at the first contact that the outpatient procedure will be carried out under spinal anesthesia. This procedure would make things much easier. It is very, very important. Change takes time. This graphic shows the percentage increase in spinal anesthesia after the introduction of the substances pridocaine 2% hyperbaric and chloroprocaine in our outpatient operating room of my former clinic over a period of seven years. So be patient. Now, after this presentation, I want you to take home some messages. Spinal anesthesia and ambulatory surgery is a safe and reliable technique. Before you implement it in your setting, rethink your processes. Give intravenous premedication. Use thin and atraumatic spinal needles. Use prilocaine 2% hyperbaric in low doses. Be restrictive with intravenous fluids. Consider discharge without voiding. And only implement the technique together with your surgeons and nurses. Well, after a time of implementing the individual steps and a little practice, you will come to the point that there is no no for spinal anesthesia in ambulatory surgery. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your attention. And if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you so much and goodbye. Thank you very much, Mark, uh, for the wonderful and uh, very informative uh, video presentation. And now we are uh, entering the discussion. And uh, Roby and uh, Mark, uh, we will have a uh, discussion together because uh, the topic is the same, how to use the prelocaine. And uh, I, I saw that uh, you, you two uh, already answered some questions uh, uh, on the Q&A section, but uh, I think something, uh, some, some uh, should be uh, orally or uh, lively uh, discussed here. And uh, I, I will start with the using of the, this drug, uh, this uh, local anesthetic for the C-section. Uh, because uh, in, here in Indonesia, most of us uh, use uh, spinal anesthesia for C-section. And yeah, how, did, how do you think uh, if we use this uh, prelocaine? Maybe start from you, Roby. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I first like to say how much I enjoyed Mark's talk. Um, I, I think we sing very much from the same hymn sheet. Um, I, I would agree with everything he says. And my experience from from the UK is almost identical to his. So uh, it's very reassuring. Um, so listen to Mark is my first thing. Okay, uh, next, um, cesarean section. 
the, the drug is not actually licensed um, for use for cesarean section. It's a difficult area, um, uh, pregnancy, because uh, it requires much greater um, uh, care with, with licensing. Um, I believe uh, Philip Goffard in Belgium has used it uh, for cesarean sections very successfully, actually, um, with some significant advantages, um, particularly with respect to um, patient satisfaction um, and, uh, and also cardiovascular stability. He was able to, able to show that for an equivalent dermatomal level, uh, that there was more cardiovascular stability in the patient uh, and they recovered more quickly. So we don't use it for cesarean section uh, because it's not licensed, um, but people have used it with great success. Um, I think for elective cases, it can be very good. Um, we do, as I mentioned, we do use it for postpartum patients who have perineal tears, who might need repairs. We also use it for retained placentas as well. Uh, and it's an extremely useful drug, obviously, because the patient can be admitted uh, if they're breastfeeding and then just go straight home. So yeah, so very good. Okay. How about you, Mark? So first of all, uh, Robbie, thank you so much for your for your perfect presentation. Uh, it was really delightful for me to 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 see the um, UK practice. Um, <laughs> back, back to the point uh, to the cesarean sector. I um, have changed my my field of work from the university clinic where we also had clinic ecology to uh, an accident hospital. Um, where I work since uh, nearly five years here in the capital of Berlin, and unfortunately we don't we don't do any cesarean sectors. Thanks God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it would be really interesting to see um, to see data. So my my own my my personal opinion is um, that the low amounts of um, uh, prelocane wouldn't cause a relevant level of methemoglobin. I showed you the, the data of our, um, uh, of our study where uh, patients received about 4,000 milligrams uh, for, for liposuction, um, and there appeared a relevant methemoglobinemia. So if you use um, prilocaine in very low doses um, of 10, 20, or 50 milligram, I, I I really can't imagine that there's a significant impact on the mother or the or the child. So, mm -hmm. but as you're right, we, we there's so far there's no license. But I, I would really say the substance is really perfect for many, many, many thousands, millions of people um, with uh, with other relevant diseases, like for example the, the colorectal diseases. And what I um, what I saw is it's more a talk for spinal anesthesia which brings new options to us yeah it's it's so the new substance prilocaine two percent hyperbaric uh, opens new um new markets for for the patients or new options for the patients so this is more important for me and maybe a talk from from my history where i grew up with spinal anesthesia in in my old hospital here i bring with spinal anesthesia a new technique um, because uh, it, it just was not common to use spinal anesthesia. And with these new substances mm -hmm. um, like Prilocan, 2% hyperbaric, there, there are new options opening. So this is the most info, uh, important thing. And the, the way to convince uh, the surgeons and the nurses, the nurses are very, very important in the, in the whole, whole field. If, if they are not convinced of this, uh, um, of this new technique, you are really, really, uh, you have a really, really hard work day here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark and Roby. How about the, the side effect of this uh, prilocaine in compare with the other, I mean, like uh, bufkaine? Well, um, Mark, do you want to go first? Yeah, so I, I, I can speak for my, for my, um, uh, colorectal procedures where you where you uh, apply only half a milliliter or one milliliter of a hyperbaric substance. So, I think the most critical part of this of a spinal anesthesia is when you spray the back of the patient with uh, alcoholic disinfection. So we 
we see some I also saw some asystolia um, and we also had to to uh, uh, to do reanimation um, only because of spraying the cold uh, the the cold disinfection spray on the back before inserting a needle and therefore I really can only recommend to uh, to give a little bit of my desolan intravenously not orally but intravenously just before you start and then you you can really reduce the side effects and you you won't um have time to you no know, you you um the time to discharge won't change yeah but patients are just a bit more more compliant and um i think there are really no um, no side effects when you use it in in these low doses like half a milliliter one milliliter we only also use it for the for the prone position for example for sinus pilonidalis operations we use one and a half milliliters and then we turn them we turn them in in prone position and surgery is possible also there so we really see no side effects um concerning a decrease in heart uh, heart rate blood pressure or uh, um, in the case of um, TNS. Um, yeah, I, I, I would agree. Um, we, we actually don't spray the back with um, cold spray. Uh, makes the patient oh. jump. Oh. Yeah, we, we yeah. use a little, a little um, uh, chloroprocaine, uh, sorry, chloroprocaine, chlorhexidine uh, swab. Um, so it's a bit more gentle. Mm -hmm. The gentle English, you see. <laughs> but uh, but I agree with Mark. Uh, I agree with Mark. Um, I anesthetize a lot of young men uh, for uh, knee ligament surgery. Um, and uh, young men tend to faint when you approach them with a needle, the concept of a needle. Women are very strong. Men are not so good. So the best, and this is due to anxiety, uh, and I agree with Mark, the best approach is to give them a small dose of intravenous midazolam uh, before you start. It, it, I always do it before the spinal, highly effective. The patient is quite compliant, but they're very relaxed. Um, other side effects, I would say, you know, uh, very, very rare to have problems at all. Um, I mean, our, our, our day case ambulatory patients having, um, same as Mark, he has bigger experience than me, but certainly, uh, for perianal procedures, um, you, if you use a small dose like Mark suggests, and I use the half a mil of prilocaine, they can actually sometimes even step off the bed at the end of the operation and be helped to walk <laughs> to the recovery area. Mm, so yeah. it really is that good. Um, I've even used less than half a mil uh, for some very small procedures, anal skin tags and other such things. And I'm sure Mark would, would concur with that. Um, <clears throat> um, I actually, as I said, um, going in the other direction, uh, just because a patient is not being uh, sent home on the same day does not mean you shouldn't use oh, okay. a short-acting spinal. This is a really important point. Um, it, it makes the experience for the patient and the mobility of the patient on the day of surgery much better. Uh, and they, 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 they don't enjoy having heavy, uh, insensate legs for many hours. So the prilocaine is a real benefit. So I would do all my total knee replacements now using Prilocaine, oh, except the very obese patients or difficult patients. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it is, a, it is a, a big advantage from that point of view. Yeah. Okay. How about the met hemoglobinemia? The, uh, I, I, I uh, see that uh, Mark, you want to answer this uh, lively uh, for the met hemoglobin and also for the uh, re-injection re of the this medicine because the uh, failed spinal uh, block maybe yes um as i mentioned before we use we use these substances we use prilocaine in these very low doses that this has no relevancy on the on the uh, on the patient if you use one milliliter or half a milliliter yeah. i think it would be really hard to 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 measure to measure the substance or the methemoglobin, and even if you have a repeated dosage in in these small subs in, in these small small amounts of of pilocaine, I think there's there's no relevance. Maybe we, we should start a study with this. This would be really interesting for the for the cesarean sexes also, but um, I think this this has no um, no clinical relevance at all. And I totally agree with you, Robbie. Um, uh, I also use pilocaine for in-house patients. 
-hmm. as they want to to get up early they want to smoke they want to to eat and drink and they don't want okay. to they don't want to to sit inside uh, of the of the room yeah yeah i i have uh, <clears throat> many patients who i've anesthetized repeatedly over many years uh, and we, the, the evolution is interesting. We started off with uh, low dose bupivacaine, and then we used to add fentanyl to to try and benefit the uh, the, the spinal. Uh, um, it just gave side effects, and it resulted in itching, and and it was occasionally it would fail. And then we moved on to using prilocaine twelve years, 11, 12 years ago, uh, and now we actually use chloroprocaine as well. But certainly prilocaine. If you talk to patients who've had experience of bupivacaine spinal, even a low dose bupivacaine spinal, you compare prilocaine with it, they're all significantly happier. Um, and it's very nice when you get a patient who's actually experienced both because they'll tell you the, the benefit. Yeah, and there's also the aspect of the ability of moving the legs. Um, in the case of, uh, how do you say injuries you know from 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 laying in the operation room what's 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 the terminus a neuro neuropraxia yeah. neuropraxia yeah yeah yeah, neuro, yeah. 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 Like, like, like compression like injuries because, because I, I i showed one picture where, where the patients with the spinal moves from one bed to the other you know from the bed of <laughs> injection to the bed of and they, they well it's it's just easy and you you should really keep in mind that um one of the secrets of spinal anesthesia with low dose um, with uh, with low dose pillowcane is uh, don't use uh, um, high volumes of intravenous fluids because when the when the bladder is full um, mm -hmm. there there and, and and we all know the practice you know yeah. you 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 uh, put on the the EV and then uh, the first bottle um, is inside of the patient, then you put on the second. So be really, really restrictive <laughs> with this. I think 100 or 200 milliliters are enough and the patients can eat and drink afterwards. And this is just uh, more comfortable for the patients and for us, of course. I, I completely agree with Mark. Um, for most of my minor procedures, um, I actually do not actually attach intravenous fluids at all yeah I, I allow the patients to drink clear drink. fluids yeah. uh, until they come to theater we have a thing called sip till you send so we allow them to sip water yeah, on the ward until they're sent for from the, from the ward as soon as they come to theater and actually sometimes i even allow them to sip water uh, from a straw whilst they're in theater uh, yeah. and patients are are far better at uh, um at uh, hi uh, hydrating themselves uh, relate related to their thirst mechanism than if we we do it uh, by giving them intravenous fluids. I obviously give I tend to give intravenous fluids in situations where there's expected fluid big fluid changes and blood loss. Of course, you know knee replacement or hip replacement, but not for my minor surgery. No. Yes. Uh, I, 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 this there is a question. This is a. a I think it's uh, for, for the uh, Professor Smithner, how we can make sure that the prelocaine is entering into the and working well in very low dose. <laughs> yes. Think, yeah. So this is this is really this is really a, a, a really good question. Um, I think you you need some experience. Yeah. And you, um, and I I always say that the that the unbelievable face of the patient is the best indicator for a perfectly fitting spinal anesthesia in very, very low doses. So if I ask the patient, um, is anything changing? Then the patient says no. And then if I would give you a nut between your, um, you know, if you... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and if you could, if you, if you could, could uh, open Can it, you, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the patient, oh yes, you're right. And then yes, so then this sits perfect. So I if my technique for spinal anesthesia is I insert the the pencil point needle and I wait until the CSF um, drops out a little bit, then I give the, the injection. I don't do a, a um I do, yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't do babitage. And then I just take the syringe out and look if if it, it drops out again. So I don't wait until the drop drops out, but you see a little bit that the CSF comes out. And then I take all the needle out. And then I have 
the 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 number of uh, failing spinal anesthesia is extremely 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 low yeah. really extremely low. if you if you wait until the until the csf drops out at the end i've seen no um i, I really know no case where where it really doesn't work it's really this is really um really 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 a really reliable substance a yeah. really reliable technique wow this is all which, 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 which i don't see for example with Isobaric bupivacaen, so we all know sometimes it's uh, it's here or it's <laughs> there. It does work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my my experience is the it's, same. I, I agree. Yeah, I know no substance which works better than hyperbaric prilocaine. Yeah, yeah, it's it's perfect. Uh, we the other situation we use it for perianal work is for um, perianal abscess uh, drainage uh, in the, the emergencies. Um, these patients are particularly um, important because um, it's a very small area to anesthetize uh, and it's very, very surgically stimulating. And people sometimes make the mistake in a very large patient uh, who might have acid reflux or might smoke uh, and they make the mistake of not using an endotracheal tube and the patient is, is, is head down, uh, they're in the lithotomy position. And if you do not have them deeply anesthetized under a general anesthetic, they uh, will uh, cause you big problems. Um, and the best way to avoid it is to is to just simply do a, exactly what Mark does for his elective uh, perianal work, and that's use a small dose of, uh, of prilocaine, uh, uh, hugely beneficial, and uh, will save you a lot of uh, a lot of trouble. Yeah. And if. Uh... If it's an if it's an abscess and people are really um, are really uh, struggling the pain, yeah, it's great. Seven seconds after you've injected uh, the prilocaine, the patient says, "Oh, uh, am I healed?" Is it yet yeah, nearly? Um, but <laughs> this is also might, yeah. The patient will give you a big uh, a big hug usually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So if you like, you 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 can you can go home now, but maybe yeah. you wait for the surgeon to <laughs> yeah. to drain the abscess before. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one one last question, but this is actually the uh, very political, and uh, you can answer or you're not. This is about why why U.S. Uh, <laughs> Why, why they, they don't use it in the US? <laughs> <laughs> this is a very interesting question. Um, I think a lot of people in the world think that the, the best things and, and the, the biggest advances come from the United States. Um, this isn't always true. Uh, there are some great, great people in the United States, but actually um, the advances in spinal anesthesia with respect to introduction of these new and better agents has all come from Europe. Uh, so I would look to Europe for your, for your evidence. Um, uh, the, the states have had real trouble getting the FDA to approve prilocaine. That's their problem. Yeah. Um, they might need to drive it a bit harder. They do actually have chloroprocaine, the very short acting one, which is a, also an absolutely fantastic drug. And they work very well in combination in the UK. We, we, we um, as I said in my talk, we tend to use some to complement each other, depending on the situation. Uh, but obviously you don't have that. But uh, you're very lucky to have prilocaine because prilocaine, prilocetical or tacopril does all the things chloroprocaine does, but it's also more adaptable because it's hyperbaric. Uh, but the states, they haven't licensed it because the FDA won't approve it. So they have a problem there. They use mepivacaine a lot, which uh, Mark, I think, uses a little bit, but we don't use. It maybe it's not, it has some issues with side effects. Maybe it's not ideal. I don't know because I've never used it, but it seems that prilocaine is far, far better. So, I mean, it would be nice if they had it in the States. I think it would be a great, great uh, thing to have there, but they, at the moment, they don't have it. Mark, any comment? No. Listen to Mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've, I've no data about the. The, and, and this is really interesting. We in Germany we have no real data how much um, uh, how many types of anesthesia. Um, so, what is the percentage of spinal yeah. anesthesia compared to general anesthesia to to this and that? We have no we have no idea in this um, in this point. And I, I don't know if it's the same in the USA that that general anesthesia is. Uh, 
uh, take takes the biggest part. I think regular anesthesia and spinal anesthesia in particular has to do a lot um, of your uh, yeah, yeah, how, how you how you're taught as a as a young um, anesthesiologist and surgeon how you grew up with you know when when you grew up in a hospital where it's common to do regional anesthesia, then you will also teach it further. When you grew up in a, in a, in a hospital where only general anesthesia uh, was performed, then it's really, really hard to, for, for yourself to change your mind. Yeah, th this is my experience in a way. Exactly the same. I completely agree. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, was, I was taught that uh, the time is until 4 p.m. here in Indonesia, but it's actually wrong. So I, I must correct. We have uh, still 30 minutes to go. Dr. Susilo, any comment for the relocation for uh, C-section? I think Dr. Susilo has some experience. <laughs> Uniquely, we, we, I already asked Mark yesterday when we doing uh, practice session. But to be honest, he said that he's not working in the OB operating theater. And and also to be honest that I did it for C-section. But remember it is off the record, off label. <laughs> off label. Never uh, uh, follow me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But my, my point of view that, that this medicine is fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. So we have to do study maybe according to Mark. How about the possibility of met hemoglobin in the baby? Yeah. yeah. But I, there's a theory that uh, yes, yeah, a long time ago that it used for intra uh, intramuscular or epidural. We, we, we use a smaller dose yeah. intrathecally. Hopefully, is also not bad for the baby. That's my point of view, Pancha. Thank you, Doctor Cecilio. Because uh, I also read that uh, met hemoglobinemia will uh, come after more than 100 milligram, I think, mm -hmm. or 400. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's very big. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the next uh, question is regarding the urinary retention. Uh, mm -hmm. Robi already uh, answered, but uh, may we please uh, do it in live. <laughs> I mean, uh, maybe something that you want to explain about the retention, urinary retention? I, I mean, if, if uh, as I said, if, if you use it, even in our in our hospital, um, I looked at this before we started using Prilocaine, um, I looked at urinary retention in our day case unit, um, just gen generally for any procedure. And if you had a procedure done after 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon, your chance of staying in the hospital overnight was 35% with bupivacaine, an even low dose uh, because of delayed recovery. And um, we had about a 16% chance in young men of uh, urinary retention or delay in, in passing urine. Um, um, they weren't, didn't all need uh, um, a catheterization, but certainly there, was, there were big problems. So we introduced prilocaine and our rate went down to unmeasurable really compared with that. I think the key, as Mark said, uh, and to repeat this, is not to give large volumes of intravenous uh, fluid. The first thing that happens to uh, 500 mils or a liter of, of intravenous fluid in a young man is that his kidneys look at it and they, they dump it straight in the bladder um, and you end up with a full bladder. And even a young man having a procedure without a spinal anesthetic will sometimes develop a degree of retention due to pain. And if they have a full bladder, that's a big problem. So, but prilocaine has made a huge difference to, to the instance of urine retention in patients. Um, we don't um, particularly need the patient to pass urine before they go home. Uh, we don't, it's not a requirement in our hospital. Some of the older patients in urology, uh, the older men, um, we, um, there's, uh, we, we do ask them to, to, to check their bladder volume before they leave sometimes with, a, with an ultrasound, but it's not, the, it's not a good reason to keep them in hospital usually. Okay. Yes, and uh, well, yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Ravi. And the, the, the guidelines in Europe come more and more to the point that um, if a patient hasn't voided um, when all the discharge criteria are ready, then 
uh, you should use ultrasound and then you should uh, consider to and if the bladder is empty so there's no real reason to keep the patient um, in the hospital and you should advise him what to do if he couldn't uh, urinate for the next hours so then he has to have a number where he should call or where he should come to but with these short acting uh, locals uh, like preloca uh, pre i don't see a real problem in uh, in urinary retention at all when you when you keep in mind that you don't give too much ev fluid and let the patient regulate it when he is allowed to to uh, drink uh, as as much as he wants yeah thank you very much uh, uh, i think from panelists uh, any other comment regarding the use of prilocaine and uh, i get well yeah, if i could okay. comment i get yeah. repeated questions uh, yeah. despite my talk uh, about yeah. um why don't you use opioids yeah yeah okay, okay now okay. one of the massive advantages of prilocaine and these shorter or, or a, um, um, shorter acting spinal anesthetics is that you do not do not have to resort to using agents like fentanyl to improve the quality of the analgesia it is not required mm -hmm. um, it merely produces side effects which you don't want in in any patient uh, one of the chief side effects of using fentanyl in particular is uh, pruritus itching and it's a real problem to patients and I had a patient last week um, who said um, it had a previous Hello. spinal Sorry. 10 years before with with uh, and they had fentanyl in their bupivacaine spinal. And she said, I, I like the spinal, but I hated the itching. I said, don't worry, <laughs> we won't use it. And she was very happy. So and this is a normal uh, experience. Um, it, so I would never use fentanyl anymore with my prilocaine. It's not necessary. Um, so I think it's. I think there's also an issue potentially of contamination when you start to mix drugs with 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 spinal drugs. I, I have a big concern about this. Uh, there's an, a potential for error, uh, which could be disastrous. Uh, and also there is no license for mixing, and I don't know necessarily what it does to the drug. So I think uh, my advice would be: do not use fentanyl with prilocaine spinals. Um, there is a situation where I do use an opioid sometimes, and that's if I'm doing um, pelvic gynecological surgery, for instance, say the pelvic repair or, or a his straightforward hysterectomy, vaginal hysterectomy, um, and I might use prilocaine. Um, and I might add, we in the UK we use diamorphine for, but that's for the that's purely for the for the postoperative pain relief. But generally, I would avoid uh, opioids citrathecally for most things. I do not use opioid uh, morphine or intrathecal uh, diamorphine for post-op pain for any orthopedic procedures either. Um, I think we have far better multimodal uh, uh, and yeah. uh, motospheric regional analgesia that can achieve this. So please don't use opioids is my message. Okay. Uh, Mark, any comment about this? I totally agree. So if you decide uh, to use a product which is really, really short acting, then you should use it. And you should uh, you should change the concept by adding things, you know, of any of any kind, opioids or or, or whatever. So if you, especially in the in the ambulatory setting, you should do it as easy as possible. And there are a lot of other possibilities um, to to take the pain of the patient. You should think before before you you start the procedure what to do. Um, some. Some clinics uh, give uh, ibuprofen orally before the start of the of surgery, or uh, some uh, give suppositories when when they um, finish the the colorectal surgery, or whatever. But I I also I'm strictly against giving um, uh, opioids for ambulatory procedures with short acting locals because uh, this contradicts the whole concept, in my opinion because yeah, of, the, of the side yeah. effects in there. That, that, then I, I can use something else if I want to have a long lasting uh, local anesthetic or, or a substance which lasts 10 hours. So then I should give something which lasts 10 hours, but not a, sh a ultra short uh, acting local anesthetic and then adding other substances. Mm -hmm. This is no concept for my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I agree. So I think the message is clear for Mark and Robbie. Uh, yeah. Don't use it. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. It's a very clear message, and uh, hopefully, <laughs> we, we all will follow you. Uh, okay, uh, now, uh, there is a Janice question. Janice wants to say something. Okay, yeah, yeah, I see. Uh, uh, Dr. Janice, 
Janika raised her hand. Okay, any comment from you, ma'am? Yes, thank you. Because I wanted to ask a question in the chat, but I, in the questions, but I can't do it because yeah, okay. I'm registered as a panelist. But I, I would just uh, tell you about my own experience of having five milligrams bupivacaine uh, uh, spinally, and everybody said it was going to last so short. It took me six hours to get rid of <laughs> six hours after five milligrams of uh, pivacaine, mm. just to underscore what they are saying. Mm -hmm. But another thing is when you do sedate, when you sedate the young boys, uh, uh, it's some I would often use a small dose of propofol because of my dazolam, they are disturbed by that for a long time. And I just agree with you that the young men are worse. When I was in the military, uh, I I uh, realized how to win a war. It's just to go with the vaccine syringes in front and all the infantries would just change <laughs> one to another. I mean, it's unbelievable. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for, for this comment. I can also, I, I can, I can only agree, but um, to be more precise, young men with tattoos on the back <laughs> are the worst. I, I remember, I remember a young man, the whole back was tattooed from here to the, to, to down. And when I started to do the disinfection, he, there was really a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, uh, we, we really had to reanimate him for, for, for a minute only because of the, the vasovagal syncope. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but Mark, do you know how, how they make that though? It's also with the needle. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a total different setting. Yeah. It is, yeah. It must yeah. Be a total different setting. <laughs> young, it's, I think it's, the, it's actually the hospital setting for young men. Um, it's interesting, I've, I've looked at this a lot and uh, uh, women are, are, are better at, they, they, they attend doctors more often for pregnancy and other things. They're quite used to the clinical environment. Uh, uh, young men tend to avoid it and um, they'll suppress their emotions. <laughs> uh, women will talk about it, which is good. Men will, will they go very quiet and, and it becomes a vasovagal issue. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's interesting that uh, she mentioned um, there that the prilocaine lasted quite a long time in her perineum. Um, uh, th that's that's normal for a spinal you'll often find the perineal uh, um, numbness will last for maybe um three four hours after a, a prilocaine spinal um and that that that's not uncommon um but it doesn't stop you mobilizing that's the key factor to remember uh you might use a, a reasonable dose um but even as uh, but but you'll be able to mobilize within two or three hours after the procedure so it's not a problem um, interestingly, one of the first cases we uh, I used Pralocaine for was a 26-year-old woman who um, had had a cesarean section three months before, and she was breastfeeding, and she had a small umbilical hernia uh, secondary to pregnancy, which was painful. Um, now, she uh, had had a cesarean three months, as I said before, um, and she came in and said, I don't want a general anesthetic because I'm breastfeeding my baby. I went, well, fair enough. Uh, I like the spinal for my cesarean section, but I did not like having heavy legs and I want to go home. So I said, okay. So I actually gave her three uh, mils of, uh, that's um, 60 milligrams of prilocaine. Uh, we're, we're able to repair her umbilical hernia very successfully. Um, we used uh, some local anesthesia for post-op pain relief and some multimodal analgesia um, using, you know, um, but no opioids. And we did we did the operation at nine in the morning. She went home at uh, half past twelve. So you know, and that's with three mils of prilocaine. Um, she still had some perineal numbness when she left, but she she was able to mobilize without any problems. So yeah. Okay. Uh, any other things that? you two want to say um so in 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 okay in, in in my opinion maybe we have to um be aware of the fact that not the anesthesiologist is the one who's uh, who has the biggest impact on the choice of the yeah. anesthesia okay technique. yeah 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 this is really this is really sad and um <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But you, you have to, you really have to uh, convince your your surgical partner mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
partners. And uh, there are there are some uh, some tricks um, we we did uh, mm -hmm. when because we we had a, we had a system. It only worked when all patients received spinal anesthesia. The the, the whole process was only. Uh, uh -huh. Uh, really good working when the when when all the ten patients in a row received spinal anesthesia. Each uh, general anesthesia was a logistic disaster, and we still <laughs> what, what we did, um, uh, especially uh, patients who weren't um, so smart enough to choose the right uh, anesthesia technique for him or for her. We put him or her in a room with uh, three others, three other uh, patients who have received a spinal anesthesia uh -huh. the day before. And they had really a really interesting impact on the choice of anesthesia technique on the next day when they when they arrived at the um, at the operation room and said, oh, oh no no I am I don't want general anesthesia I talked to the to the other patients in my room and they are really convinced they told me oh I can get up very early I can eat and drink have a cigarette. Oh. Have a beer in the in the early morning again. <laughs> so um, this was really interesting to to see who uh, who is able to convince the patient and the anesthesiologist. It's sad to say, but it is like this. No. It's not. So the best is if the the um, the surgeon says yeah. at the first contact, "Oh, a general anesthesia. It's it's not necessary. We have um, it, the option um, to do it only with." Um, a small amount of local anesthetic. It's a it's a little stitch at the back, and then you can you can walk again within one or two hours. And if um, the the surgeon starts to convince the patient, it's really really more easier for us yeah, to uh, to start the project. Okay, yeah, I I agree. Uh, we um, I I set up a project uh, two years ago. Um, uh, to do unicompartmental, unicondylar knee replacements as day cases. Um, so the what we did was we got a group, a multi multidisciplinary group. We had the physiotherapists, the nurses, uh, the porters, the the orderlies, the ward reception staff, the catering staff. We all met together, and we talked about the whole process of the patient. And the important factor was we found was the surgeon first seeing the patient, like Mark says, uh, if they said, um, this is what we do, the patient went, yep, that's what I'll have. That's fine. The surgeon told me that. So that's fine. Um, it's then they come to a class before the surgery a week before where they're taught by the physios how to use crutches, what exercises. And they're also given we've made a video and they, they can watch it online from home or whatever. And it has a previous patient talking about their experience. And they say, oh, yes, uh, you don't need a general anesthetic. It's done this way and it works really well. And so the patients come in and it's already, I have nothing to say. I just say, what are you, what are you having? And they go, um, this is what I'm having. And they've already been told. So it makes my job much easier if the whole process is set up by the whole team before I approach. So actually my influence is like about this much, <laughs> whereas actually the surgeon and the rest of the staff yeah. They do most of it. And it's really the multi multidisciplinary approach is important. The other benefit, of, of course, is if you're doing a lot of um, uh, arthroscopic surgery, the patient gets to watch the operation. And we often have a situation where uh, they've not been offered a, a, a spinal anesthetic before. And you say, well, would you like to try it? And they go, oh, I don't know. I might want to be asleep. So quite often they might have some midazolam before the spinal. But when they get into theater, I say, well, how do you feel? And if they go, oh, it's okay, it's quite interesting, I'll watch you on television, then I don't give them anything more, we just talk. Um, if they're very anxious, um, then you might need to give them something, but actually generally most patients who express some concern are actually fine, so. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah thank you very much for the presentation and uh, all the good things in discussion also. And uh, I think we have to, in Indonesia, we have to try more and convince our surgeons so they they can talk to the patients and also <laughs> the patient experience okay thank you very much uh you. Robbie, and thank you very much uh, Pleasure. For, for this time and i, I give uh, this time back to uh krisha okay
Thank you, Dr. Pancha, for leading the discussion. The discussions, uh, we have seen a lot of questions about Prilokin. I think uh, this might be the science that uh, our Indonesian colleagues are eager to try this medication, these drugs. Uh, so thank you again for giving your insights and experience uh, regarding this drug. And I would like to thank also uh, B. Brown, uh, B. Brown Medical Indonesia for sponsoring this event. Uh, so hopefully, uh, who knows, in the near future, we can can see each other and we can invite you to Indonesia. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye. Thank you bye. so much. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you.